Thank you. Uh, they serious. I'm Ashley Burgoyne. I'm a postdoc at the Music Cognition Group uh, with Henk Jan Honing in the University of Amsterdam and a guest researcher at the Netherlands Institute for Sound and Vision. And I want to talk to you today about uh, does MAR need to be more catchy? Um, but I'd like to start by actually having everyone play a little Name That Tune game with me, um, if you'd be willing. Uh, so what's that tune? Please don't shout out the answer. Uh, they, I'm, going to, I'm, going to give you, um, I'm going to give you four examples, uh, four fragments from actually the same song. And just when you recognize the song, uh, if you just raise your hand and we can kind of get a sense of, of, of how quickly people are able to recognize it. Uh, they, so here's the first fragment. Does anyone recognize it just based on this? Okay, yeah, a couple people, not so many. I think most people are feeling like, okay, really could be anything, couldn't it? All right, how about this one again? Please don't shout the answer, just raise your hand. Um, also, if you raised it before, but everyone who knows it up to this point. The French are too. Any more? Yeah, only really just one or two more. Okay, all right, how about from example number three? Again, don't shout the answer, just raise your hand if you know it by now. Kiss of the hand may be quite continental. Okay, yes, that it again is an amazing. Now, if you and if you don't know it by now, you almost certainly if you've ever heard the song before, surely you know it after hearing. But diamonds are the girl's best friend. Right. Uh, they uh, so for those of you who know the song, or for those of you that don't know the song, I guess at this point, that is Diamonds Are a Girl's Best Friend, as sung by, very famously by Marilyn Monroe. Uh, they, but it's, uh, it's kind of an unusual song, or not such an unusual song. I guess I, I give you this example to make the point, um, and, and is what I really mean is my answer to the question, does MAR need to be more catchy? I just want to make the point that when you think of a piece of music, actually different fragments differ very markedly in the impression they make. Um, on our on our mind, and uh, and in particular, different fragments stick much better in your memory than others. And so, when you want to ask any kind of MAR question, perhaps it makes sense not to look at the song as a whole, but to try to actually delve into the different fragments and and see how they may fit in the musical mind. So, I want to kind of highlight. In a sense, this is a sneak preview of the talk that I'm I'm going to give on on Sunday. Um, I'm going to kind of give you just a kind of just enough of it so you can understand the rest of the talk. Um, so you can get a sense of of a data set we want to provide to the MIR community, and then I can spend the rest of my talk here focusing on okay, what can we do with this as MIR researchers? And so then, if you want to skip my talk on Sunday, you can. Although there will be more kind of cognitive information there. It's kind of it's they're very different angles. Um, in the end, our goal uh, for the MIR community is to produce a database of popular music fragments, so actually segments of songs, not necessarily entire songs, um, in some way that there is actually potentially access to the audio for researchers who need it. Um, we want to provide some measure of long-term musical salience. So, you know, what, what is the, uh, in the cognitive sense of salience, what is the kind of absolute, you know, noticeability or memorability of a particular fragment in the human mind over the long term? Um, we also want to provide some pairwise comparisons of the catchiness as rated by humans of these different fragments. And we also have a kind of serious game design we have for gathering this kind of data, um, which is how we're going to provide the database, but we think that actually the design itself might be interesting with an MIR. So I want to give you just, again, a really too short preview of just how that game works, just so you can kind of understand the rest of the talk. If you want more details, come hear me talk about it on Sunday. Um, but the, the basic concept uh, is that it's a, it is also a name that tune game. I mean, not so different in a way than what we displayed at the beginning of this talk. Um, we have a song that's going to start playing, generally from somewhere in the middle of the song. So it works uh, kind of like a drop the needle exam, if you've ever taken a musicology course. And for those of you that are too young for drop the needle exams, uh, this is the, actually even I am technically too young, I always kind of like drop the CD exam. Uh, the, uh, but, uh, but the drop the needle exam, the idea of it is in a traditional musicology, music history course, um, back in the days of LPs, uh, the professor would literally drop the needle somewhere on an LP, and you would have to say what the piece of music was. Uh, they, so song starts playing from somewhere in the middle of the song, and you need to decide whether you know the song or not. Um, if you say no, you just move on to the next song, nothing happens. If you say yes, 
uh, then you have a certain number of points at stake to win or lose, basically based on how quickly. So the faster you recognize, the more points you win, but the more points you can also lose, because we have to check, since this is a game where actually we we'll hope people will play outside of the laboratory, we need to check that they really do know the song. Uh, even in the laboratory, you probably want to check this. But outside of the laboratory, you definitely need to check, do you actually know the song? And so again, just moving a little too quickly, uh, they, once the player guesses, uh, the sound is going to mute for just a few seconds. Three seconds is the value we found to be the most effective. While the sound is muted, we ask the player to sing along in his or her head, try to follow along with the song as well as you know it. And then after those three seconds, the sound returns again. And when the sound returns, sometimes the song it will be playing where it should be if it really was just a three second mute, sound cut out, sound come back up. And sometimes it's actually just a few seconds offset. Not a huge number of seconds offset, but just enough that if you were following along well in your head, you should be, oh wait, something's wrong here. So then that's our verification. Did you really know the song? If you guess correctly, you get all the points. If you guess incorrectly, you lose all the points. And very quickly, that's the concept of the game. Again, if you want more information, I will ask me or come to my talk on Sunday and you can hear all about it. Uh, they, but for MIR, what I want to talk about a little bit is, is first, how are we going to analyze this data after, after we've collected it? Because we want to analyze it in a way that really we think will make the database very useful for MIR researchers. And so we're going to, to haul out a psychological model, actually all the way back from 1978, uh, the drift diffusion model um, from uh, Ratcliffe, um, who actually is based in Toronto, isn't he? Uh, they, I, I think so. And they, um, so I, when it originally was proposed, actually, computational power, I don't think it was really all the way there yet. Nowadays, you can fit this model in MATLAB if you like. There's free software um, from the Catholic University in uh, that will fit the model for you. Um, what does it mean? So just as a quick tour of it so you have a sense of how you'd interpret the data that comes out. Um, so it starts with this idea that the longer you're exposed to a musical stimulus, the more information you're getting about do I know this piece or not. That's fairly obvious, doesn't require that much more explanation. Um, one thing that's a bit novel is that it acknowledges that different people, some people are just more conservative than others. Some people really want to be sure before they go out on a limb and say, yes, I know it. Now in our game, yes, we're trying to provide an incentive with points to get people to do it as quickly as possible possible, but even with such an incentive, some people are just going to need to be more sure than others um, before they say yes or no. And so you have this parameters kind of zero to A is kind of the range of, you know, so how much information does the particular subject need before they'll make a decision one way or the other. Separate from that, you also have this parameter Z. So what Z is, is a kind of optimism parameter. So independently of the fact that you might just be a bit more conservative and need more time or less time, you also just might be more pessimistic or optimistic about your ability to recognize music in general. Um, some people may just start being like, oh yes, I'm really good with pop music trivia, and you know, will be very quick on the trigger um, you know, to say yes, I know it, and actually will take relatively longer to really admit, actually, no, I really don't know this one. And for other people, it will be just the reverse. Um, the people that say, oh yeah, I'm really bad at the kind of music trivia and are just going to assume they don't know things um, unless they're really, really sure. And so this parameter is that, again, lets you tune that for every subject in your experiment. So you can kind of, in a sense, those values in and of themselves aren't so interesting. It just kind of makes those differences in your subjects go away uh, for you, again, for the purposes that we want to analyze the experiment for. The parameter we're interested in is then just this average slope. Once you've corrected for the differences in people's conservatism and optimism, what is the relative speed at which information is coming to you um, when you hear this fragment of music? And the argument we're making is the catchier, the more memorable the fragment, that faster that information is coming in. And the more obscure the fragment, the slower it's going to come in. Now, surely if you know the song, eventually you'll always guess it. Um, but it's going to take you a lot longer. And this is the parameter that we think is actually going to be most interesting for people. But just so you understand the rest of the model, um, it's a kind of random walk model, so it doesn't assume that that information comes in at a strictly linear rate. Is that it kind of comes in like, oh yes, I think, oh maybe I don't know it, oh maybe I do, yes I do, oh maybe I don't, maybe I do. And then eventually you hit your personal threshold for, okay, yes, I know it, or no, I don't. And then what you get is a very nice looking reaction time distribution that's, uh, that in a sense is just a bit more motivated um, than some alternatives like just using a log normal, which you know, gives you a shape that visually looks right, um, but isn't necessarily motivated in an obvious kind of cognitive way. Uh, they, so it's a very, very nice model. And again, now we have the computational power that it's not necessarily a problem to fit it. There's software in MATLAB that will do it for you. Um, and so it's, it both has a benefit of being computationally tractable and very, very nicely motivated uh, from a psychological perspective. So what we want to do after we analyze that is to, to provide a data set. So first, in order to get around the, the problem of, okay, but access to audio, how do you do access to audio? If you want long-term musical memory, 
artificially generated music really doesn't work for you because if you just generated it for your experiments, you know full well that people haven't been listening to it for a long time. So you really need to have music that, or we really feel we need to have music that people have listened to and conceivably have known for a very long time, but then you have all of the copyright problems. What are we going to do about that? Well, our solution is Spotify. Uh, so in a sense, uh, just both for the players of the game, they have to be Spotify users, which means effectively they're paying for the audio they're using to conduct the experiment. Uh, they, uh, but then it, then it also means that if you're a Spotify user, you've also paid for the audio that we use to conduct the experiment. So we can provide a Spotify URI, which gives you the track ID and then also the specific time within the track. And then anyone who needs to, not necessarily forever, I mean, it's not an all-time perfect solution, but we think it's, a, you know, given the technologies that are available now, a kind of compromise to get a very large collection of music that people really have listened to in a way that at least a certain club of people can kind of get access to the audio in a certain way. You also get the Echo Nest features for free for most Spotify URIs. You can just plug in the Spotify URI, get the Echo Nest features, but if you want your own, you can use LibSpotify and compute them yourself. As long as you don't save the audio on your own computer, it shouldn't be a problem. Obviously, we're going to provide this parameter U, so the drift diffusion model slopes, which in a sense is a measure of how quickly can people actually recognize, uh, how people can people actually recognize the song, which is kind of the parameter we think is, is the useful addition to MAR models. And then also, just so you can do a reality check on our data, that accuracy measure for how often players were fooled by the continuation for a different fragment of music, how often did people actually guess incorrectly. It's a useful thing to know. On average, it seems to be about one in five is what we found, but, um, but in any case. There's another bit of data that we also are going to include. So sometimes we turn the game around and we just ask people, okay, here are two fragments from the same song. You tell me which one is catchier. So that's actually different than the memory task where we're actually testing how quickly people can recognize music. Here we're just asking you, which one do you think is more memorable? And then we store that. And the advantage of doing so is, of course, that you get an extra column where you have, uh, basically, you get a partial ordering of segment, segments based on how catchy people thought they were. Preliminarily, what we found when we did our pilot study is that there's a surprisingly poor correlation, a significant but a very small effect size between how memorable people think sections are and how well they actually do when you ask them to it, which is really quite interesting, which is why we think it's important to kind of provide. So as an MIR researcher, should you optimize how well people actually are able to remember the fragments or how well they think they're going to be able to remember the fragments? In a sense, it's up to you. We're going to provide you both so you can choose. Now, what are you going to do when you have all of these data? So one approach, uh, one kind of strategy, and where we want to start, uh, is really kind of more oriented toward collaboration with musicologists who study popular music, also with music psychologists, and that would be to derive audio features that correspond to some of the many hypotheses that are out there for what constitutes catchy music, what constitutes a hook. And I mean, I'm just going to give you very quickly, you know, kind of one list um, of just some of the theories that are out there uh, from a paper from 1984. So I mean, this can certainly keep us busy um, as a research field for, uh, for a certain amount of time, as you can see. I, I won't actually take the time to read them all. Uh, they, another approach actually would be to use a more traditional MAR style bag of features, not necessarily interpretable, but perhaps giving you just a stronger predictor for either people's actual recognition performance, that drift diffusions to slope, um, or how catchy people thought the music was going to be. Either way, you're going to end up with some kind of model for a segment of music for how memorable is it? Can I predict how memorable this segment is going to be? Either based on how memorable people think it will be or how quickly they're actually able to recognize it themselves. And then what can you do with a model like that? Well, we propose that one actually very useful thing is just a kind of smarter thumbnail if you need to browse a large music collection. I mean, there are different strategies for doing the NMAR already. Um, this kind of strategy is actually particularly useful because of the connection to musical memory when you're dealing with cultural heritage collections. And actually, one of the projects I'm working on as a guest researcher at the Netherlands Institute for Sound and Vision, uh, right now they are digitizing this beautiful collection of 78 RPM discs they have from the 1930s to the 1950s of some of the earliest recorded Dutch popular the music there is. Um, so we're going to have about 10,000 tracks of this um, within the next year or two. 10,000 tracks of Dutch popular music from the 30s to 50s is a lot. Even the most committed researcher um, is probably not going to want to listen to all of that from start to finish. It'll take a very long time. Um, but if you can actually kind of jump in and say, well, this is probably the most memorable part of it, that's useful as a researcher. But then in particular for a heritage institution, if you think of the user base, um, the people who remember the music from the 30s to 50s, these are people who are quite a lot older now. Um, these are people who certainly are not necessarily going to want to sit in a museum and listen to 10,000 tracks of music. Um, but if you can actually 
find them saying, oh yeah, do you actually remember this fragment? Do you remember this fragment? And can kind of predict, and this is probably the bit that's stuck in the memory the most, you have a way to actually make the collection much more accessible to your users even outside of a research perspective. At least that's our hope. Um, Going into more traditional MIR, um, just as, as information retrieval, um, we'd argue that actually weighting, you're weighting a query based on its memorability. So when a user is querying a database, in many cases, they may actually want the most memorable section. Or maybe for your application, you think they want the least memorable section. But either way, rather than just saying, oh, they're looking for the song, odds are they probably aren't looking for the song. They're probably looking for a particular section of it. And you can make a hypothesis about that based on how memorable you think it is. And we think that's an important thing to do. And then finally, for the age-old question of music similarity. Again, traditionally, that's been thought of as a similarity between an entire piece of music. Is this piece similar to that piece? But we'd propose that actually when people are talking about distinction, they're probably talking about the parts of those pieces of music that they remember best. And so throwing away the big band interlude in the middle of Diamonds Are a Girl's Best Friends might actually be a very good strategy. Throwing away the French march at the beginning of it may be an even better strategy. Um, if you really want to get a sense of what in the collection is similar to Diamonds Are a Girl's Best Friend as people are thinking of it when it's in their head. Um, I don't want to run over time, so I'm going to close it there. Um, it's a kind of big project, uh, but we expect to do 2,000 songs. That should translate um, to about 30,000 song fragments. We're aiming for 5,000 players. And, uh, and we're doing that with, of course, a lot of help. Um, and so here's a list of people that have been helping me. And uh, I'm happy to take any questions. Um, in the back, I think I saw you first. So there, there's a list that's too long. Uh, the one that, that, you know, to really, I mean, do I know the answer to all of it? No. Um, the one that perhaps many of us are most familiar with, iTunes. Um, so far as I understand, it is one minute in. You start at one minute, regardless. And that's hope in that. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Either way, you get what you get. Um, I saw over there first, and then I'll take Professor Temperley. Um, in, in the example that you were playing, the, the diamonds are the Yes. You started with the theory to their band thing. I did. Yes. Is there cues from music theory or things that you look for that might be catchier parts of songs than others? Well, that big list that I put up, you know, is kind of one of the laundry lists for different theories that, that people have for what it might be. But I, I think you actually hit on something at the beginning of your question that was even more interesting than anything on that list, um, which was this idea of kind of specificity, I mean, or, or kind of uniqueness. And, and is this fragment kind of generic? Is it unique? That's a really difficult thing to, to, to formalize. It's a difficult thing to measure. But I'd venture to guess it's actually well worth that intellectual effort. If you really thought of, OK, well, what would make a piece of music? Because that actually is salience. What would actually make a fragment stand out as opposed to being generic big band? It's going to vary from genre to genre, but you're going to expect catchiness to vary from genre to genre anyway. Um, but uh, I have to say, it isn't something I'd thought about in quite exactly those terms. And I think, I think it's a really good idea. I, I think I will, because it's a sense of, it, you know, it, well, in any case, it's probably enough on that. But thank you. It's a good question. Yes. For the, um, <clears throat> the test where you play them the next bit or a bit that's just played, you might want to just get some baseline data on how people, how good people are at that, even when the song isn't familiar. Uh, we have that, actually, yeah. you know, from a pilot. Yeah, we, we do have that in our pilot study. We did it in both. And we also um, asked people to really kind of, in a sense, try to cheat. Try to say you know the song before yeah. you really know the song and see if you can still do the task. Yeah. And so we did actually that there's uh, uh, my actually my Ismer paper um, has will have some of the analysis of, of that side of things. But yeah, no, it is very important, but we've done it. Yeah, we've done it. There just wasn't time to put it all in in 15 minutes. Yeah. Uh, I'm just curious if you look at uh, uh, other uh, sort of uh, recognition based models than the new child mission and uh, the drift diffusion models and the computation based on uh, that uh, model based on cohort theory. I, I have to be honest to say I haven't done as exhausted. I, we kind of did a very kind of preliminary look at it. The drift diffusion model 
seemed like it was a really good match for what we wanted to do. Um, I think it's actually something I would, especially when we move this more into the world of, of you know, kind of journal publication, it is something I want to look at more carefully. Um, but as of right now, it hasn't, again, we did the kind of quick, you know, over, okay, here are some of the ideas. This one seems to be particularly appealing. And, uh, and, and so that was what we've done for now. But it, it, it's a good suggestion. Yeah, it's a good suggestion. But as of today, as of today, I, I, I can't give you much of an analysis of it. Sure. Um, here? Um, so I'm just wondering why you chose to do that um, accuracy class instead of, for example, like forced, forced choice recognition. Um, because, I mean, I think you, you can even see through your results that it's very difficult for people to do. It's very taxing on working memory, and it moves you skills that aren't necessarily what you're, you're trying to assess their semantic memory for if you know this song. And what you're actually testing is, well, OK, can you now sing along to it? And if you're doing that as many times in a row, that's quite mentally exhausting. So, so I'm just wondering why you chose that one. Instead of one of our motivations for it was actually because if, if you want, it actually kind of comes from some work that Carol Crumhansel has done. I mean, if, if you're really just asking, can you guess what this song is at a rate better than chance? Um, we already know the answer to that, and that's less than half a second. I mean, it's like it's really, you get some information very, very quickly. That isn't the sense of musical memory that we're interested in. We actually want to get people at the point where they really have recalled enough of the musical image to memory that they really can sing along. And so anything that didn't force them to do that. We really wanted a musical task so that you had to do something, so that you had to sing along. And so it actually was quite a deliberate choice because it's sort of a different question. If it's just, can you recognize the songs and can you choose that out of the list? We already, I mean, there already has been very good research on it. It's a much shorter time frame, and it's, and it's a, just a different task than we were really interested in. Okay. Any preference for on versus off? Or? Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you.